Hello, everybody. Uh, how many lectures are left after I'm done? I'm the last one? Okay, fantastic. Right. So <laughs> that's always good to be the last speaker because you know people are anxious to get done. So I said under 35 minutes, it's probably going to be less than that. Um, so as far as the internal medicine boards are concerned, uh, sarcoidosis has a pretty uh, straightforward um, knowledge set that you guys are, should be required to have. So hopefully it won't be too long. If you have any questions, of course, just feel free to interrupt. I may ignore you depending on where I am. Okay, so uh, what we're going to talk about today is uh, what you have on the screen in front of you. Um, and so let's get started. All right, so first of all, what is it, right? So sarcoidosis is basically, it's a multi-system inflammatory disorder, right? And uh, the, one of the, well, it's not a diagnostic tip, but it's defined by the presence of non-caviating granulomas with rare exception, okay? And these granulomas are present, and they can be present anywhere in the body, but there are some areas of predilection where they, they occur more, more frequently, uh, such as the lungs, which is why a pulmonologist is giving this talk. Um, and it's not a disease that happens frequently in childhood, although it is seen sometimes. Um, it's mostly seen in the adult age group, and generally the peak incidence is somewhere between ages 20 to 40, uh, although it can occur later uh, in that as well. And um, I've listed some of the more predominant findings. Okay. So um, how do you make the diagnosis of, of sarcoidosis? The American Thoracic Society, along with other international organizations, has sort of listed a few key features that they want a patient to have uh, when a physician is making the diagnosis. So first of all, the picture has got to fit with the, uh, with the context of, of the patient, right? And you need to have non caseating granulomas when you do a biopsy. And you've got to rule out some of the confounding uh, variables that may be present. So other diseases can present like this, and you want to be sure you rule them out. Now, with respect to the biopsy, it's not an absolute must uh, if you have Lofgren syndrome. And we'll talk about that a uh, couple of slides down. Okay. Uh, the key thing is there, there is no single test that you can do to rule in sarcoidosis. Right? So it's sort of a, um, you've got to have the right patient, right history, right imaging studies, and put that together with the right biopsy findings, and, and you sort of make the diagnosis. Uh, the other thing is uh, non caseating granulomas are the, like I said, uh, they're what you're looking for when you're trying to rule in sarcoidosis. However, in a small percentage of cases, less than 5%, you'll have caseating granulomas. But for your boards, non caseating granulomas. All right. So again, for the internal medicine boards, uh, and actually for the steps also, uh, when you have a young African-American female and she presents with hyaluronopathy on a chest x-ray that was done for some routine reason, uh, that's basically, your, those are all your buzzwords that you're looking for when, you're, when, you're, when you want to call it sarcoidosis. In reality, as I've said, um, you know, it occurs in a wider age spectrum and a wider gender spectrum. So men and women, of course, the women part of it, have, there's more sarcoidosis in women, which is true across ethnicities uh, than, the, than we have it in men. Okay. So when somebody comes to you and you've really, uh, recently made the diagnosis uh, and someone asks, well, how did I get this? You know, um, what, what, is, what is the answer that the majority of you would choose? Would you choose, how many people think A is the right answer? How many people think B is the right answer? Okay. How many think C is the right answer? One person? Okay. Okay. Uh, and how many think D is the right answer? Okay, all right, good. So, um, so it's not a great question because it's, <laughs> um, there's more than one right answer. I should have mentioned that at the beginning, but okay, we'll go over this. Uh, again, for the boards, the prop proper answer is this, but um, so there is, um, there, there's several associations, several theories as to why we think people get sarcoidosis. It's not entirely clear, but uh, the reason A was right was because there is some hereditary component. In any case, um, so some things that, some of the earliest uh, case reports of sarcoidosis, uh, they came from, uh, they came in patients who had exposure to things like, you know, stoves and, and uh, environmental exposures. And then later on, uh, you know, we found that there's, uh, there's different occupations that have a, a known association with developing sarcoidosis, um, such as uh, some stuff that's listed over here. And interestingly enough, um, fire, New York City um, fire department workers who uh, helped in the rescue at the World Trade Center 
on 9-11, uh, there's a lot of those, uh, there's, um, there's, there's been an association between that and developing sarcoidosis, in addition to other uh, lung diseases. So, so there is that, the environmental theory, right? But then there's, there are other uh, associations that we found. So for instance, um, researchers have, have discovered that when they do a PCR analysis of like a non casein granuloma, sometimes they'll find evidence of you know, microbacterial DNA or, or RNA. So then that raises the possibility, well, you know, maybe it is an infectious etiology behind this. And then um, the AXIS study sh showed that people who have sarcoidosis are more likely than people who don't have sarcoidosis to say, yeah, my mom or my dad or my sibling or my parents, somebody has sarcoidosis in the family. So it's not a great Mendelian um, um, propagation, but there is a association with, with genetic predisposition. So um, this is a boring slide, but basically, uh, this describes how granulomas are formed. And essentially what happens is you've got something that incites inflammation. And within the context of that inflammation, you've got cells, macrophages that come together. And then those macrophages, once they're stimulated enough, they, they form into epithelioid cells. And then some of those epithelioid cells become multinucleated giant cells. And as, the, the, as this collection gets older and older, there's a ring of fibroblasts that form around it. And then you've got your classic granuloma. Okay, so this article from the New England Journal uh, is a summary of what I just described. Um, so you've got, you know, a something in the envir environment. It could be an infectious e agent. It could be non-infectious. It comes into somebody who's genetically predisposed to getting sarcoidosis. And then you've got your antigen-presenting cell, which presents those antigens, whatever they are, to a T cell that releases cytokines, that goes down to a CD4 cell, that goes into TH, helper 1, helper 2 cells, and then all this uh, together forms uh, a granuloma. Now for some people, the granulomas, I mean, so let's say at this point you've made a diagnosis, some of those will resolve completely and some of those will progress, okay? And we're not really sure why, uh, why that happens. Okay, and you may get a picture of this on your board. Or, um, uh, this, is a, this is normal lung tissue and this is a granuloma and within the granuloma, there's a giant cell, okay? So whenever you, um, so there's nothing special about a sarcoid granuloma as opposed to a non-sarcoid granuloma. So that's why whenever we, um, whenever we do a biopsy, for instance, on the bronchoscopy, uh, we always ask the lab to, to, do, to run an AFP stain culture on it as well and to rule out um, uh, fungal infections as well. Okay, so clinical features. Um, the, a, a vast number of people are, are found incidentally. So there's the, you know, the, the board question about the woman who comes in for a routine chest x-ray and which is abnormal. Um, they can present with systemic symptoms. You know, so you've got your classic fatigue, night sweats, um, which is actually the, the more common one. And some people can present with weight loss as well. Uh, a lot of symptoms are organ specific and we'll talk about those in a minute, but if you've got a particular organ system involved, if there's an eye involvement, the patient's gonna present with that. If there's skin involvement, the patient's going to present with that. Uh, Lofgren syndrome is that one case of sarcoid where you don't really need a biopsy. You can just diagnose it clinically. And that's, um, so you've got uh, erythema nodosum, which I'll talk about in a second, arthritis, and bilateral adenopathy. If you have that, then you've made the diagnosis of acute sarcoidosis. Okay, so there's a picture of what, um, let's see. So I think I have a better picture later on, but that, there's an example. So you've got these very tender, very painful subcutaneous nodules that the patient presents with, and that's erythema nodosa. Okay, so organ-specific features. Um, so 90% of the time, sarcoidosis will present with, with lung involvement, okay? And um, this can be asymptomatic or it can be symptomatic. Uh, when it's symptomatic, you know, the, the usual cough, shortness of breath. You know, in pulmonology, we don't have a lot of variation with respect to the symptoms that people present with. So Basically, everything gives us the same sort of uh, complaints. Um, the lung examination, depending on the degree of involvement, can be normal, it can be abnormal. Abnormalities, again, there, there's limited, uh, there's a limited repertoire of lung responses, so you can have crackles, wheezing. Uh, your PFTs can be completely normal. They can show a restrictive pattern, they can show an obstructive pattern, or they can you know, uh, just have abnormal diffusion, or they can have a combined pattern. When we, uh, on bronchoscopy, it's sometimes you'll see very clear, very evident cobblestoning, which 
a little like little pavement type uh, nodularity on the on the bronchial mucosa, and when you see that, that's actually pretty specific for, for um, sarcoidosis. Um, whenever we do a bronchoscopy, a lot of people do BAL, and that serves two purposes. One is to rule out an infection. The second is uh, you do a, uh, a cell count and you look for CD4 to CD8 ratio. And classically, and again for the boards, the CD4 to CD8 ratio is going to be more than 2 is to 1. Now, with respect to x ray findings, there's a classification scheme of sarcoids. So it goes from stage 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, it's not necessarily a temporal stage, and it doesn't necessarily correlate with, with dysfunction. Okay? But in general, stage 0 is better than stage 4. So, um, so here's the, f the, f uh, the five stages that we have. Um, stage zero is basically a normal looking x-ray, and if the patient does have any symptoms, you know, th there's a very high likelihood that they're going to get better and, s and they're going to stay better. Stage one, first, the first stage has uh, enlarged lymph nodes. The second stage has enlarged lymph nodes plus abnormal parenchyma. The third stage, the enlarged lymph nodes sort of go away. And the fourth stage is basically end-stage lung. And if you've got end-stage lung disease from sarcoid, then obviously that's not going to get better. So the likelihood of spontaneous or even induced remission is, is very, very low. Okay, so that's uh, a normal-looking x-ray, except that you can see that the um, there's a little bit of promise. Some of this is PA, but some of that is, is actually uh, lymph nodes. Now, compare it. Comparing this x-ray, and I'm not sure how well it's projecting with this one, you can see there's definitely some, you know, parenchyma involvement, okay? And you still have got your hyaluronic lymph nodes over here, right? So that's uh, stage two. Stage three, you've got less of a prominent lymph node, uh, uh, lymph nodes that are present, but your parenchyma involvement is still present. So that's three. And then that is, uh, you know, you can see, hi sorry, you can see some hyaluronic retraction, how they, as the as there's volume loss that's going on, the lungs are sort of th they're getting distorted, and that's stage four. Okay, so that was the lung manifestations. Um, now we'll quickly go through some uh, uh, some of the organ system manifestations. So we'll see a lot of, of uh, abnormal skin lesions uh, that can be seen in sarcoid. Uh, a lot of times you'll see mac uh, macules are are the most common one, but you'll, you can see papules and the plaques as well, and uh, they can be present anywhere in the skin, but uh, classically on the back of the neck, upper back. Um, you see them on, on, the, on, on the, the trunk as well as, as, well as in the arms. Um, so here's an example of, of fairly disfiguring sarcoidosis. Okay. Erythema nodosum, I showed you a slide earlier. This is probably a better representation. And you can see there's multiple you know, spots that are present. Very, very tender, very painful. Um, and they'll go away within a matter of weeks. Okay, lupus perneo is another skin manifestation. This is, uh, unlike the, the lesions that I showed you before, this is typically involves uh, you know, the, the head and neck area, and uh, it's purplish in color, and it's, it's it can be very disfiguring. Um, and if you have lupus perneo, the chances that you're going to have uh, a progressive kind of a sarcoid is, is actually pretty high. All right, neurosarcoid. Um, so neurosarcoid, it's not that common. Uh, I know that the, the, um, the slides is about 10%, uh, but I, I think it's far less than that. That's, a, that's the numbers that we get uh, from these large registries. But, but in general, the, we see a lot less of neurosarcoid. And apparently on the autopsy, there's, there's more uh, neurosarcoid that's present. In any case, um, the patient's going to present with a neurologic uh, symptom, and they can have cranial, cranial nerve palsy. They can have ataxia, weakness, seizures. You get your imaging studies, and Generally, the, the CAT scan is not that helpful, but an MRI is, is very, can be very suggestive of neurosarcoid. Um, you can go off of that, but if you go ahead and do a CSF, uh, you'll see presence of lymphocytes like you would expect. And um, so you can do a CSF uh, ACE level, not particularly helpful, just like a serum ACE level is not necessarily particularly helpful, um, but, it, but it may be elevated. And you can also have some oligoclonal immunoglobulin bands. Uh, but the, the basically the imaging study of choice in that case would really be an MRI. Um, and if you have neurosarcoid, you know you need. Uh, this is not a case where you start off with prednisone. You probably want to go very strong, very aggressive. 
um, like immuran, cytoxin, something like that, in addition to high-dose steroids. Um, sarcoid can, can involve the eyes. Um, anterior uveitis, where you get that redness, is probably the most common. Uh, about 65% of sarcoid um, involvement of the eyes is anterior uveitis. Um, if you, so you, any patient who has sarcoid has to see an ophthalmologist at least once a year. Okay. Um, if a patient is diagnosed with anterior uveitis, the initial therapy is topical steroids, and if that does not work, then you know uh, they can go on to systemic steroids. Okay, cardiac sarcoid. Um, <coughs> again, uh, when someone is diagnosed with with, um, with sarcoidosis, always get an EKG, make sure there isn't any rhythm abnormalities, because sarcoid can affect the conduction pathways. The granulomas uh, are, can be present there. So that can cause tachyarrhythmias, bradyarrhythmias, and cardiomyopathy. Uh, Dr. Huizar, uh, for those of you who remember him, he had a patient here who uh, presented with pretty bad CHF to uh, cardiology, and eventually he was also diagnosed with sarcoid. Um, so I believe he was scheduled to get a um, LVAD or something, like that. so the EF was really poor, very symptomatic, and Dr. Huizar started him on a very aggressive regimen uh, of imiran, prednisone, um, and I think for some time got remicade as well. And the patient turned around completely, so the cardiomyopathy was resolved. Um, and the patient, you know, was went from a near heart association in class four to, to one, basically. Um, not typical, but but I mean, certainly can happen. Uh, MRI, uh, cardiac MRI, is is uh, is pretty helpful for this. And if you do find some abnormality on the um, on the EKG, then it's probably a good idea to send them to an EP guy, make sure that there's nothing that can be, in, in like a ventricular rhythm that can be induced because you want to get that fixed. Hypercalcemia, also known to occur in sarcoid in, in small percentage of, of patients. And really it has to do with the fact that the uh, macrophages in the sarcoid granulomas, um, they, they, they can cause activation of vitamin D. So it goes from 25 hydroxy to 125 uh, dihydroxy vitamin D, and that can cause, you know, the, you guys are familiar with the, uh, the mechanism, but can cause hypercalcemia, hypercalciuria, which can in some cases also lead to renal failure, okay? So once you've made a diagnosis, it's, it's a good idea to at least initially get a calcium level and then as needed, or maybe, um, there's no recommendation on a follow-up, but you know, probably once a year at least get a calcium level. Okay, some other things to think about when you're uh, considering the diagnosis. Again, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So, um, so the, the, the diseases listed on the board are, um, are some things that you should think about. They don't, they're not, they don't all mimic sarcoid. So, I mean, some of them, for instance, Wegner's has, has a lot of features that differentiate from sarcoid. The one that's actually pretty similar to sarcoid, it's, it's hard to differentiate both from a, um, a imaging and a pathological uh, diagnosis is beryllium exposure, which can occur in, in, in uh, multiple industries. And there was actually a case series that came out from Israel where um, they had a, a sarcoid clinic in which they had, I think out of 14 patients that they tested, maybe six or seven, they were um, positive for beryllium. Um, so you can do a, a test for uh, exposure of your leukocytes to beryllium, and it was positive. So uh, those patients have been misdiagnosed with sarcoidosis. So once they, the test was done, they went back and they asked the patients and all of them reported one or other form of, of uh, exposure to these industries. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, so the mycobacterial infections is actually the number one differential that we have when we're thinking um, of a non-caseating uh, or caseating granuloma. Uh, but there's others that are listed on the board also. So <coughs> moving on to the final leg of the lecture, uh, treatment. So the question for the group is, does, so once now you've established a diagnosis, you've ruled out everything else and you're pretty confident this patient does have sarcoid, does that automatically mean you're gonna start treatment? How many people think yes? Okay, how many people think no? Not sure, good, all right. How many people think not sure? So uh, treatment is, is um, not without significant adverse effects, so you should be cautious before starting it. Um, and remember that a lot of times people who have sarcoidosis does not necessarily mean that it will progress. Uh, a lot of patients will actually rec um, recover spontaneously. And um, so think about, uh, think about that at the time that you're, like the chart that I showed you earlier, if you've got 
stage one, uh, then there's more than 90% chance that you're, you're going to recover spontaneously in any case. Some authorities, such as the, the British Thoracic Society, uh, recommend that once you've made a diagnosis, unless there's something that acutely needs therapy, give it a couple of months, maybe three to six months before you even start, even prednisone, just to give them time to spontaneously regress. Okay. All right. But when should you not wait when it comes to starting therapy? So there's a, and some of these are pretty evident, but essentially um, all these things are, uh, are conditions which are, which are going to make that patient pretty sick. Okay, so if the patient is really sick, and the, or there's a high chance of progression of disease, then don't wait to start therapy. So examples include obviously eye disease, cardiac involvement, neurologic in involvement, severe hypercalcemia, severely disfiguring skin lesions, um, thrombocytopenia. I mean. I've never seen, um, I guess that doesn't mean much, but if you have severe thrombocytopenia, uh, progressive hepatic failure, um, severe pulmonary involvement. So those are really things, so if a person is, is sick enough, for instance, to be hospitalized, or, or there's something that there's a good chance of progression, then don't wait, start therapy right away. Okay, uh, this may be the last question. Uh, so which of the following drugs has FDA approval for sarcoidosis therapy? Cyclophosphamide, let me say yes. Okay, prednisone, how many say yes? Three, four, thank you, okay. Um, Celsec, methotrexate. Are you guys just sleepy or is like somebody's going home? Right. Imuran, okay, so the answer is none of them, okay. Not, not a single one of those drugs has FDA approval for, for sarcoidosis. And the reason for that is because a lot of the trials that we have are actually pretty small. They're not substantial enough to, to sort of um, give enough proof for the FDA to give uh, give it consent for, for to put a put, put it on the label. Having said that, I mean prednisone has been used not quite since time immor immemorial, but for a long time, and people have responded to it. So it's conventionally accepted as the first line of, of therapy. And uh, so the experts, and by the experts I mean the ATS, the ERS, and something called the World Association of Sarcoidosis, and other granulomatous disorders. Okay. Anyhow, all these people, they say, uh, so it's when you're starting treatment for, pre uh, for sarcoidosis, start with prednisone. Prednisolone if you're in England, but in the U.S., use prednisone. Um, and you can start at 20 to 40 milligrams a day. Now, if you've rounded with the pulmonary service, you'll note that when we're starting therapy, we generally start at a slightly higher dose, we typically go with a milligram per kilogram, usually at, at around 60. But the official recommendation is start anywhere between 20 to 40 milligrams a day. And then the goal is if the patient responds to the, that therapy, so let's say you, you put them on prednisone, you're like, all right, come back and see me in a couple of weeks. So they come back in six to eight weeks, and they're getting better, then you want to start tapering down your prednisone, and you want to taper it down very slowly. Um, there's no advantage to using short bursts of therapy. So it's not like you put them on prednisone for you know, six weeks, and then you stop it. Um, so, or even shorter than that, you want to at least treat somebody who you think needs treatment for at least nine months to a year, okay? But having said that, if you've started somebody on prednisone and they've come back six weeks, not much of a difference, maybe you up the, up the dosage a little bit, uh, come back again another six weeks and they're not really getting better, then chances are they're not gonna, then prednisone in and of itself is not gonna do the trick. At that point, you want to consider either escalate therapy or figure out, you know, are they not, uh, are they not just not taking the medication? Um, so, or that they have a disease that's just not going to get better from them. Okay. okay so, this article actually uh, raised an intriguing um, or attempted to answer a, uh, an interesting question. Uh, so they said, so we've been using prednisone for a while now. Does it actually make a difference? And so what they did was they looked at um, all any all the studies up to 2008 that were present that involved treatment of prednisone, of sarcoidosis with prednisone, or an inhaled corticosteroid. So any trial that was had a, a control arm and a, and a case arm, and then they looked at all the studies, and then from, from that big data pool, they extracted eight trials, which they thought were uh, appropriate enough, and they, they met their inclusion criteria, and this is what they found, okay? So they found that oral corticosteroids do help, okay? They do make things better, uh, radiographically speaking, and they and from a PFD standpoint, there's an improvement, okay? But they noted that this was a small improvement, not a substantial improvement, okay? And, if, and they said that there's no evidence to date that prednisone or an inhaled corticosteroid will stop progression of disease, okay? Also important. 
And remember, a lot of these patients are going to regress spontaneously, so we may be essentially treating ourselves when we have somebody comes in with a you know, shortness of breath and we think it's tarquin and we put them on prednisone, and you know, six weeks later they're doing a lot better. It may be that they're just going to get better on their own in any case. Um, or it may be that our data, we just don't have enough data. So in any case, what the meta-analysis sort of concluded that the prednisone, there's no evidence to suggest at this point that it stops progression of disease. Uh, inhaled corticosteroids, not really particularly helpful for sarcoid so far. Okay. Uh, I sort of went over this point already. If you've got stage one disease, you know, just some lymphadenopathy on the x-ray, and otherwise you're, you know, they're doing well, then there's really no, no reason to treat. Okay, um, so here's a, a nice algorithm um, that you can use. A patient comes in with symptoms, so you've made a diagnosis of sarcoid already, but now at this point, patient comes in and he does not have symptoms, well, just because you have a diagnosis of sarcoid doesn't mean you need to treat it, and don't do anything. Patient comes in with a single organ involvement, okay, and such as the skin, for instance, if you can treat topically, you, you treat it uh, with hydroxychloroquine. Um, and if you don't have a response, then you can move on to an, uh, systemic uh, steroids. Or if a patient comes in, has severe symptoms or multi-organ involvement, then you can start your, your oral therapy, okay? Now let's say you get a response, you start tapering it down to less than 10 milligrams a day. Um, the reason that number is up there is because if you're more than 10 to 15 milligrams a day, so you're chronically on, on on prednisone for 10 to 15 milligrams or more, then there all those adverse effects that were all sort of have been drilled into us, they're going to have a higher chance of, of happening. So if you can't get your patient down below 10 to 15 milligrams, um, then it's probably a good idea to, to see if you can use a second line agent uh, to use that as a steroid sparing agent. Okay. Um, and so what the graph recommends is if you, if you can get it down to less than 10, fantastic. If you can't, then you use something like methotrexate. Okay. All right. Um, so, with respect to the the non-steroidal anti um, or steroid sparing agents, um, there's not a lot of good data. There's like one trial with with methotrexate that was a randomized trial, and they found that methotrexate. So, um, what happened was they put people on prednisone, and at a certain point, they said we're going to randomize you to either prednisone alone or methotrexate and prednisone. And what they found was with the methotrexate, the prednisone requirement went down, which is, you know, I think, to be expected. Uh, but in terms of outcomes, there's really no difference, okay, except that there was a lower incidence of prednisone usage between the two arms, okay. If there's a lot of skin manifestations and that's like the primary presentation of the patient, then uh, many experts are, are going to use hydroxychloroquine as the first line agent. Okay, and I think this is the last slide. All right, so when somebody comes to you and says, all right, what are my chances? How am I going to do? Uh, two-thirds of the patient are going to go into remission within the first 10 years. And of these two-thirds, more than 50% are going to go into remission in the first three years, okay? And typically, the people who go into remission are, are not going to have a relapse. There's a very small percentage that are going to relapse. And they're going to do well in general. They're not going to have uh, significant consequences. One-third of the patients with sarcoid are going to have disease that, that's not going to go in, that's going to need progressively increasing uh, doses of, of immune modulators such as prednisone, methotrexate, remicade, something along those lines. Okay. Uh, sarcoidosis in general will not cause a patient to die, uh, except that if it has causes progressive pulmonary fibrosis, you go to stage four, and, and you know, you basically at that point, um, so respiratory failure can occur, um, and then uncommonly because cardiac involvement is, is not that common to begin with, but then so there is a small proportion of patients who go into sudden death from, um, from cardiac sarcoidosis. Okay, so in summary, there's a really good article in the New England, New England Journal that, that came out uh, seven years ago. Um, and that sort of summarizes what I, what I said, um, but it's a good article, it's worth reading. A lot of the stuff that's mentioned is still true. So um, if you're not working this weekend and you, know, and you feel like reading, try reading this. Um, the initial assessment, you do a good history physical, uh, make sure you take a good occupational history. Um, once you find a target organ, try to get a biopsy if you can. Uh, chest x-ray is always good, PFTs are great. 
Um, ECG, you want to make sure there's no cardiac involvement. Eye exam is mandatory every time, uh, uh, yearly for every patient who has sarcoidosis. You know, CBC, BMP, uh, LFTs. Um, ACE level, not really particularly helpful, neither s particularly sensitive nor specific. Some experts do use it to monitor disease progression, but if you're on ACE inhibitor, then that may affect the results and who isn't these days. So um, not a great test. Um, and then depending on which particular organ is involved, you can get additional testing done. Um, Follow-up is, is based on the least invasive test that you can do. So for instance, in the clinic, we'll, we'll do 60 minute walk test, that's, that's pretty non-invasive, or we'll do spirometry on our patients with sarcoidosis. Um, and that's really it. Yep, okay. I'll be happy to take any questions, yes. So for instance, okay, so if they've got, if you're, if they're on prednisone and they're, and you're not able to get them off the prednisone or, and the prednisone level is more than 15, 10 to 15 milligrams a day, then at that point I would seriously consider using a second line agent like methotrexate. Yes. Yeah, so it's a good question because, uh, and it's a good thing to consider because we don't really know what particularly is driving, uh, you know, like a flare up basically of sarcoidosis. So it's unclear whether there's some change in their immune status that's happened, and that could be, you know, done by, you know, like uh, an actual disease, mental stress, something like that. It's unclear what causes a flare up in disease. Just like the sort of intrinsic uh, inciting event behind sarcoidosis is, is unclear. So you would, so typically what we do is we start them, so you know, if they're on therapy, we escalate therapy, and if they're not on therapy, we start therapy. And that's sort of, you know, and again, you know, typically you, know, you can go up to like a milligram per kilogram of prednisone and see if that helps. If it doesn't, and you're sure that's what the cause is, you've ruled out like an infection, something else like that, coexisting disease, uh, then you can go on to, you know, imuran, uh, methotrexate, something along those lines. Yes. So if you have somebody who has neurologic symptoms, right, and so you get a CSF study and it has, he has lymphocytes that are present. So, you know, that could also be something like a, a viral encephalitis, for instance, can cause neurologic symptoms and it'll have a lymphocytic teocytosis. So if you got an ACE level then, and it was elevated, uh, then in the right context, that would point you towards sarcoidosis as opposed to like the viral syndrome. But it's not, so the absence of an elevated ACE level will not prove that it's not neurosarcoidosis. And furthermore, uh, an MRI will be very, very helpful in differentiating uh, viral encephalitis versus a sarcoidosis versus neurosarcoidosis. So it's, it's helpful if you're, it, it supports your pretest probability, but you can't use that as a single sole determinant of whether or not this patient does have sarcoid or not. No, I don't think that there's other conditions that you'll see an elevated ACE level in, but it's just that the fact that it doesn't necessarily go up in sarcoidosis or neurosarcoidosis precludes its, uh, its meaningful use as a, as a marker. Or for that matter, so for instance, if you had, let's say, neurosarcoidosis and you, and you had an elevated ACE level and you started them on therapy, there's no guarantee that, th that the ACE level will go down once, once, you've, uh, once you're treating them. So if it's not particularly useful as a marker of disease severity or progression, and it's not particularly useful as a, m as a diagnostic tool, then 
probably not particularly useful getting it. And from this very sleepy group, any other questions? Okay, all right. Enjoy the weekend.